celebrating 10 years of real sports. From our studios in New York, your host, Brian Gumbel. Good evening, and welcome to Real Sports, where tonight, race is on the front burner. Since we first started playing games in this country, issues of race and racism have left some ugly marks in the template of American sports. And while few would argue that numerous problems of inequality endure to this day, we rarely nowadays see, hear, or tolerate overt expressions of racism directed at athletes on our fields of play. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said of games in Europe. There, where the sport we call soccer and they call football is king, ugly examples of overt racism not only persist, they are actually commonplace. Given that we're living in the supposedly advanced year of 2005, you may find it hard to believe what black players are still going through on the pitches of European football. England fans on the rampage, attacking anything that moves. On those few occasions when European football has made news in the States, it has generally been for incidents of fan violence, or as those abroad call it, hooliganism. What has rarely, if ever, been mentioned is the level of outright racism that persists in the game. Throughout Europe, it is football's dirty little secret. Black players pelted with bananas. <laughs> routinely serenaded with monkey chants. And even occasionally hung in effigy. I'd got abused horrifically. I got threatened with my life because of the colour of my skin. I had people shouting abuse at me, spitting at me, purely because of the colour of my skin. What would they shout? Nigger, I'll kill you, you black bastard. Anything that they could think of. We don't want niggers like you in this country. Go back to where you come from. It's the kind of treatment Carl Saunders says he came to expect when he played professional football in Europe in the 80s and 90s. Did you ever get the monkey chant? Oh, monkey chant. I got the bananas to go with it. Come on. What, they throw bananas at you? Yeah, yeah. We're talking one or two, ten or twelve? No, 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 ten or twelve. Put it this way, I could open a market store. Saunders retired from the game in 1997, but racial abuse is still the norm from right-wing sections of various stadiums. Bananas are still being thrown, and the monkey chant is alive and loud. Do you have stories like that in American sports? 2005? No. no. That, that, exactly. No. no. 2005? No. 1955? Yes. Not 2005. That's where I'm like, wow. This is like we're going back. <laughs> this is like we're going back. Thierry Henry is one of Europe's biggest stars. Genius at work! His name is Thierry Henry! He helped France win the World Cup in 1998. He's captain of the famed Arsenal Club in London. And he's been called the greatest striker in the game today. But even players of his stature aren't immune to the racial abuse. Until you never have been abused, you don't know how it is. You don't really know how it is. You've heard the monkey chants? Yeah. Common? Yeah. <laughs> it seems like the stadium is like, it, you're free to say whatever you want to say. You're free to do whatever you want to do. One time, I went to, to take the corner kick. I could feel some stuff on me. And I, after I, I took the corner kick, I just turned. And my, my shirt right here was full of, of spits. You know, they were spitting on me. It's not just the fans. Last year, Henri was on the receiving end of a racial slur leveled by one of the highest profile coaches in all of Europe. Luis Aragones, Spain's national coach, was caught on tape referring to Henri as a black shit. The Spanish national coach referred to you as, quote, a black piece of shit. When you first heard it, what was your reaction? You have the show, I think, punked in America. I thought that was, you know, they were trying to wind me up or something, you know. I thought the camera was in the room. Yeah, you've yeah. been punked, yeah. But then I saw it in the news. Then I saw it again and again. And I was just like, wow. I can always forgive, I can never forget. The insult leveled at Thierry Henry by the Spanish national coach put the issue of football racism on the front page of virtually every newspaper in Europe. Still. It might have been quickly forgotten, but for what happened several weeks later at Madrid's Bernabeu Stadium. There, in a match between the national teams of Spain and England, the crowd of 50,000 plus put on an ugly display of racism that shocked and disgusted observers throughout all the continent. Oh, that's dreadful. 
Liverpool. The way they're shouting every time Sean Wright Phillips gets anywhere near the ball. Every time one of England's black players touched the ball, monkey chants rained down from the stands. What made this night so different was that it wasn't just a few thousand right-wing fans shouting the abuse, but the vast majority in the stadium. We saw in most of the stadium, about 80 to 90 percent of the stadium, um, getting involved in racial abuse of one kind or another. Piero Power runs Kick It Out, the biggest anti-racism campaign in Europe. He was at the game that infamous night in Madrid. This is a Spaniard saying, we're pure. You've been infected by, by black blood, if I can put it in those terms. Your national team has so many black players. What's the worth of that national team? There were other racist taunts from the crowd as well. Throughout the game, some fans bounced in rhythm as they chanted, jump up if you're not black. You chart these incidents. Talk to me about the degree of frequency throughout Europe. It depends on, on where you're talking. Once you go to Spain, Italy, um, Eastern Europe, then I think it's fair to say in every game. Every game? Every game, I'd say. What are the root causes of this? Um, in very many of these societies, people will be seeing a person of colour for the first time when they appear on a football pitch. Uh, and they're responding to that. They're responding the way in which they respond to people who they think are subhuman. On a European continent historically resistant to immigration, there's now a desperate need of immigrants. With their shrinking and aging populations, the nations of the European Union, experts say, will have to take in almost one and a half billion immigrants over the next 50 years, simply to sustain their present economies. Right-wing groups are exploiting resentment of those realities at football games, where passions are always high, and they have an open stage to express their hatred towards anyone who's different. These groups are well organized, with names like the Ultras in Madrid and the Untouchables in Rome. They actually have stores where they sell merchandise to raise money for their racist causes. Many have headquarters near stadiums where they gather before games. And once inside, they control a section of their stadium game after game, where they openly display their wide-ranging bigotry, like with this banner, which reads, Auschwitz is your homeland. The ovens are your home. When we began to investigate this story three years ago, we took a hidden camera inside that area controlled by the untouchables in the main football stadium in Rome. There we witnessed fascist salutes and total chaos in the stands. Just last season, one of the untouchables' favorite players brazenly sent this message back to them from down on the field. Given the passions and the politics, the almost all-white football crowds have proven a perfect place for many right-wing extremists to spread their xenophobic message and recruit new members. This basically was, and still is, a white Christian country, and we, we want it back to be like that, as it was. Steve Reynolds works as a cab driver in London. Right, four, right, right, He's also one of the leaders of England's National Front a right-wing party that has for decades been pushing for the ouster of all black people from England. You distribute your organization's literature yeah. at, at football games throughout That's England, right, is that yeah. correct? Yes, why, right. why at football games? Because it's a good recruitment uh, area for the National Front. We've got a lot of white working class people who are disillusioned with the government or governments, and uh, so it's, it's very good recruitment for us. You're very welcome among these people. Majority of the grounds, yes. Not all the grounds, but the majority of the grounds. What's your view, sir, of the racial abuse suffered by the black players commonly throughout Europe? We believe it's a way of the people showing their disgust of them people being in. So you don't want any ethnics no. playing in England, no. for England? Definitely not for England, no. Well, what's the difference between a white player who's born and bred in the UK and a black player who's born and bred in the UK? Because we don't class them as, as being um, British, really. Why not? They were born and bred here. Well, does, does that make, because a, a dog's born in the stables, it might get a horse? So it's simply by the colour of their skin? Yes, yes. What motivates someone to, to be that ridiculous? What goes through their minds? What builds up so much hate towards someone they don't know? Did you ever consider leaving the pitch and coming across the barrier and confronting a guy? Many times, many times. And even though in my heart I've thought to myself, if I went over there, I would knock that bloke out. I would be doing no better than what, what that person's doing, which is being ignorant, being abusive and being aggressive. 
Although groups like the National Front are able to use football as an effective recruiting tool, England has actually made significant progress in reducing the levels of racism from the stands since Carl Saunders played. Using closed circuit cameras to monitor the crowds, the authorities, armed with a new law, have been able to arrest troublemakers. Which begs the question, if England can clamp down on racist abuse, why can't the rest of Europe? We traveled to Switzerland to ask that question of Lars Christer Olsen. He's the CEO of UEFA, the governing body of European football. To those Americans who are appalled and who say, look, we've got our problems, but I can't imagine this happening on American fields of sport in the year 2005. How the hell can that still be happening here? What do you say? I think football in Europe is so popular so that we sometimes we become uh, victims of our popularity in a way because extremist groups of different kinds are trying to use football as a platform for, for their views. And racism is one, one part of that. What punitive actions have you taken against clubs whose fans have demonstrated racist behavior? Normally we start with a warning or a, a fine, but you have to be careful so that you are not using a sledgehammer. We don't believe in punishment in general. Punishment is the ultimate uh, way of, of uh, taking action. It has to be combined with education and conferences and dialogue. But your critics could say you've been doing this for years. Yes. And the problem is still quite extensive and quite serious. Of course it is. And unfortunately so. But I think football in general is uh, reflecting the society in general. Do you think that football's governing bodies have a complete understanding and appreciation for the depth of the problem of racism? I don't think so. I don't think so. Why, in a way? Because to understand how it is on the pitch when, when you're a black guy and, and being abused, you need to be black. You need to walk in the shoes. Then, that's why I would say they don't understand how it is. I saw the, the pictures in the hallway of your executive board. They are without exception male, they are without exception white. Yes. Can an all-white board have a true appreciation of the depth of the problem if there's no representation with someone of color? Yeah, I think so. You're probably asking if it would make a difference if there would have been a colored individual uh, in the board. Could have made a difference, of course. While Olsen and UEFA continue to struggle with the problem, Thierry Henry has tired of it. So he's now spearheading his own anti-racism campaign. His Stand Up, Speak Up program encourages fans everywhere to be intolerant of the racist behavior that has become all too common at football games throughout Europe. Stand up. Speak up. I couldn't, you know, like, close my eyes and, and don't say anything. I, I, I felt I had to do something. Not for me, because for, for maybe the one coming after. Would you characterize yourself as you look down the road as an optimist? Or do you think we could be doing the same thing five, ten years from now? I just hope that we won't, you know, doing the same thing in a fall. What do you think? I just, I just don't know, you know. I, I just don't know. Thierry Henry's Stand Up Speak Up campaign isn't just about doing commercials and making public appearances. He's also come up with a wristband to raise money for the cause. Since January of this year, they have reportedly sold more than three million of these bands, raising almost $10 million to fight racism in the stands of football stadiums across Europe.